Ahlan Biko. Uh, today we're going to study the oral cavity, but because there are uh, some details to be mentioned in the oral cavity, so I divided the lecture into two parts. This is part one. Uh, we will be dealing with the uh, roof, uh, walls, and uh, a part of the floor of the oral cavity. So let's begin. The oral cavity, it's a cavity that extends between the oral fissure, the, the opening between the lips, backwards to till the oropharyngeal isthmus. Remember the oropharyngeal isthmus? The one that's produced by the folds raised by the palatoglossus, not the pharyngeus, palatoglossus and continued upwards and on the heart palate and downwards on the floor on the sulcus terminalis of the tongue. These are the boundaries of the oropharyngeal isthmus and through it to the oropharynx uh, posteriorly. So it extends anterior from the oral fissure posteriorly till the oropharyngeal isthmus. The upper limit is the um, roof which is hard palate and soft palate. And the floor is made up of a, a diaphragm, muscular diaphragm, uh, composed of the, the mylohyoid muscle and the genohyoid muscle and the tongue. The tongue. Of course, this is the major structure that occupies the oral cavity. Now, the cavity is divided by the dental arches. When you close your mouth, uh, both uh, dental arches come uh, on top of each other, against each other. So the cavity, the oral cavity divides into an oral cavity proper that is enclosed by the dental uh, uh, arches, that is behind your teeth when you, when you close your mouth. And the area between the dental arches and the lips anteriorly and the cheeks laterally. This is called the vestibule of the mouth. So the oral cavity is divided into by the dental arches when, when they come against each other into the vestibule, uh, which is the outer uh, surrounding part, limited by the lips and the cheeks and an inner part, which is the oral cavity proper that is enclosed uh, by the dental arches, يعني الفراغ اللي بين وراء أسنانك. لكن الفراغ اللي برا برا الأسنان بينه وبين الشيكس وبينه وبين اللبس the vestibule of the mouth. Functions of the oral cavity, of course, it's the upper uh, inlet uh, for the digestive tract. Uh, we use the mouth to manipulate uh, the voice, uh, the sound produced uh, to uh, turn it into speech and for breathing in case that the uh, upper airway is obstructed or something we can uh, breathe through the, uh, th the mouth this happens in common colds all of us did that now an idea a hint about the mandible we'll study it in details uh, later but this is the mandible posterior view this is anterior view uh, observe the mental foramina uh, that uh, transmits the mental nerve and vessels. Observe the ramus of the mandible and the condyloid process and the neck of the mandible and the coronoid process anteriorly. Uh, observe the mental spines that will give origin to the inferior ones to the genohyoid and the superior ones to the genioglossus, which is the tongue itself. And of course the teeth have 16 in each jaw, adult teeth I'm, I'm, I mean. Uh, observe the angle of the mandible, the rough inner part surface produced by the medial pterygoid muscle and the rough outer part produced by the masseter muscle. Uh, of course observe the mandibular foramen, that, uh, the one that transmits the inferior alveolar nerve and vessels guarded by this projection called the lingula. It's the, because of the attachment of the sphenal mandibular ligament. We will study this uh, with the TN joint. Detailed, uh, uh, detailed um, information about the 
uh, components of the joint. Okay, uh, the walls of the oral cavity. Uh, by the cheeks. The cheeks is a muscle actually sandwiched between the skin from the outside and the mucosa, oral mucosa from the inside. And the muscle is the buccinator. Buccinator muscle is the muscle of the cheek. Now it's classified as muscle of facial expression because it's supplied by the facial nerve. Any muscle supplied by facial nerve, except of course the stapedius, for example, or stylohyoid, I mean on the face, they are muscles of facial expression supplied by facial. It originates from, remember, the pterygomandibular raphe, the one that uh, extended between the hamulus of the medial pterygoid plate, downwards till an area uh, behind the third molar, rough area. Remember, it gave origin to the superior constrictor, common with the buccinator that doesn't only take from the raphe, pterygomandibular, but takes from the adjacent bone on the maxilla, maxillary process here, alveolar process and the alveolar process of the mandible, part of the bone, I mean, and then goes anteriorly to be inserted in a collection of connective tissue, a node here called the modulus, that receives insertion with many other muscles like the rhizorius and labialis and orbicularis for for example. So it goes anterior and insert. Remember, it doesn't insert into bone. The muscles of facial expression insert in skin, the connective tissue under the skin. So that's the course for the buccinator. Now, uh, the parotid duct comes this way. It pierces the buccinator after it traverses the masseter muscle, pierces the buccinator opposite the upper third molar then runs in the muscle substance to open in the oral cavity opposite the upper second molar. Now, the common question about this, about the parotid duct, but trust me, I, I, I got these questions in, in my exams, the, especially the British, the British ones that insist on details. Um, the, it's, it's well known that the parotid duct pierces the muscle buccinator and then opens uh, opposite the upper second molar but they catch you in the pierce site where did it pierce it at tooth before because it has an intramural part it has part that runs inside the substance of the uh, of the buccinator uh, the buccinator then acts like a, a valve a valve for the parotid duct secretions and actually uh, a slight pumping action on the duct whenever it moves it sucks the saliva from the parotid to the mouth and this helps in speech of course especially that the parotid is the one with the watery secretion I think we mentioned that in uh, the submandibular region when we uh, were discussing the submandibular gland and we talked about the watery secretion and mucus secretion. The parotid was uh, the biggest gland, largest gland, and has the more watery secretion of uh, saliva. Now, the buccinator, it, it uh, holds the cheek against the alveolar uh, uh, arches means it, it close uh, makes the cheek goes closer to the teeth means that it's it compresses the vestibular um, uh, vestibular space um, uh, between the uh, between the teeth and the cheeks um, got that so it pushes food between the teeth it always pushes food between the teeth now in a case like facial paralysis, for example, the buccinator will be paralyzed because it's supplied by the buccal branch of the facial nerve. It will be paralyzed. One of the symptoms or signs of facial paralysis, other than the face being pulled to the healthy side, uh, on the affected side, there will be uh, drooling, dribbling of saliva because the buccinator is not working. 
it, it's not pushing the contents of the vestibule of the mouth to the inside, to inside, to the oral cavity proper. So drooling or dribbling of saliva at the affected side. And when eating food dripples from the affected side because it's always in the vestibule and nothing is, is pushing it against between the teeth to be ground. Uh, understand uh, understand this this is a, a, a very important note about facial paralysis and the action of vaccinator of course uh, when paralyzed we won't be able to whistle these are the signs of of the facial paralysis or Bill's palsy it's called Bill's palsy you we will get to that with the face okay that's uh, that was about the walls the roof is made of uh, two components a uh, hard component which is the hard palate and a soft component which is the soft palate we're looking at the hard palate see the all this is the hard palate the hard palate actually separates the nasal cavities from the oral cavity so the hard palate is the floor of the nasal cavity what else it's made of two bones the maxilla and the palatine bones see these are the horizontal plates of the palatine bones this side and this side and these are the horizontal plates uh, of the maxillary bones uh, they uh, unite in a suture in the midline and suture between the uh, maxilla and palatine you can see that eventually now observe this foramen formed at the anterior uh, side of the heart palate, anterior aspect of the heart palate, right, right behind the incisors. It's called the incisive foramen. It's an important foramen for transmi transmission of vessels and nerves, like the greater palatine and the nasopalatine. We will study this. Incisive foramen. This is the incisive foramen. It's covered by a fold of mucosa called the incisive papilla. We will see it. See? This is the uh, heart palate anteriorly. Posteriorly, observe the greater palatine foramen, which is part of the palatine bone. This is the greater palatine foramen, and behind it is this tiny lesser palatine foramen. Now, logic to say that structures coming out of the greater palatine will go anteriorly and supply the heart palate, and this is, this is actually what's happening with the greater palatine nerve and vessels. But what comes out of the lesser palatine, actually it's behind the heart, the heart palate, but what exists here, the soft palate. So the lesser palatine nerve and vessels supply the soft palate. Remember this, lesser palatine for soft palate, greater palatine for uh, heart palate. Okay, these are uh, the remarks on, 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 on this specimen. Okay. <clears throat> Now, this is another picture of the heart palate, uh, talking about the oral mucosa. See, it's covered by mucosa. Now, um, if you put your thumb inside uh, your mouth against your heart palate, you will feel dimples, many dimples. These dimples, because the mucosa is pulled to the heart palate by perpendicular fibers, vertical fibers, called the Sharpies fibers, and they make dimples on the surface of the heart palate. These dimples, important. First, first observe when you, when you uh, when you put your uh, when your finger in your mouth uh, that the mucosa of the floor is loose, but the mucosa of the heart palate, which is against a bone, is is actually uh, firmly bound to the bone. It does not move. This is very important. Imagine. Uh, uh, putting a membrane on a, uh, a piece of wood or a table it will be uh, lacerated torn uh, especially when food uh, when chewing food so the rough surface to provide uh, protection for the mucosa for the mucosa doesn't move while chewing and the rough surface gives a, a tight grip on food on the bolus of food See, and it makes other folds here, the transverse folds, called the transverse palatine folds. And the median ridge, see that? This median ridge 
that terminates anteriorly uh, at an elevated part of the mucosa called the incisive uh, incisive papilla. The incisive papilla, when you peel off the mucosa, covers the uh, incisive foramen we saw in the last uh, picture. See the incisive foramen. So the incisive papilla is the work of the mucosa. So uh, remember the dimples, remember the transverse uh, folds, palatine folds, and remember the median ridge, the median longitudinal ridge or palatine raffae. It's called palatine raffae. Uh, that ends in the inc incisive papilla that covers the incisive foramen. Now for the soft palate, the soft palate hangs here at the back. Okay, and we saw it with the pharynx. Remember the uh, picture of the laryngopharynx? We saw it hanging. It hangs from here. Yeah, and it means it's, it's attached to the posterior border of the hard palate. Right? And so its anterior border is attached to the bone while the posterior border is uh, is attached is is free anterior border is attached to the bone anterior border attached to the bone and posterior border is free this free border see this free border actually the uh, the uh, soft palate it's hanging like that to act like a valve when it's raised it closes the phare uh, when it's uh, uh, raised. It closes the pharyngeal isthmus, the one that limits uh, or separates the nasopharynx from oropharynx. And when it's depressed, comes down with the arches going towards the midline and elevation of the back of the tongue. This will close the oropharyngeal isthmus, which is this line this area of the oral cavity see limited by the palatoglossal folds not the palatopharyngeal beyond the palatoglossus posteriorly we are in the oropharynx and we studied this see the palatine tonsils there okay now uh, what is it made of actually it is a tendon of a muscle it's the tendon of the tensor villi palatini muscle the tensor villi palatini muscle we will uh, get to it descends from the base of the skull and turns around the hamulus and expands into an aponeurosis the aponeurosis meet that of the other side in the midline okay so uh, uh, it's made by the aponeurosis of the tensor Veli palatini muscle. The levator veli palatini works on it. The palatoglossus, the palatopharyngeus, also works on the aponeurosis. And in the middle of the aponeurosis, you will find uh, a tear like uh, uh, object hanging in the middle. This is called the uvula. And when you peel the mucosa off the uvula, you will find a muscle called the musculus, musculus uvulae. Uh, it comes from the posterior nasal spine and to the connective tissue of the uvula. We will get to that. But remember the uvula, the aponeurosis, which is made by the tensor veli palatini uh, uh, muscle. And what does it do, the um, soft palate? Okay, I brought you the picture again. This is the soft uh, palate, see? And this is the back of the tongue. The tensor veli palatini uh, muscle from the um, uh, scaphoid uh, area called the scaphoid fossa between the two pterygoid plates, the medial and lateral, at the base of the skull, descends um, along the lateral pterygoid plate, lateral side, sorry, of the medial pterygoid plate. Uh, remember, the lateral pterygoid plates, uh, they deal with the infratemporal fossa. The medial pterygoid plates, they deal with the pharynx. They are for the attachment of the pharynx. So it descends along the lateral surface of the medial pterygoid plate and till it reaches the hamulus, it turns into a tendon, 
still rounded tendon. The tendon turns 90 degrees medially around the hamulus. Then it expands into aponeurosis. But before it does that, while the tendon is turning, it has to pierce an origin of the muscle. What's the muscle that takes from a structure attached to the hamulus? Exactly. The buccinator. It has to uh, pierce the origin of the buccinator, goes medially, and expands into an aponeurosis to, meets, to meet its um, uh, counterpart in the midline. See that? Okay, um, the anterior edge of the soft palate, the anterior edge attached to the back of the hard palate, to the posterior border of the hard palate, while the posterior edge is, is uh, free. And uh, the action of the soft palate, actually, uh, it acts like a, a, a uh, valve so we are talking here about the action of the tensor veli palatini muscle it tenses the palate it's called tensor it's aponeurosis get tense when the muscle contracts so the palate will act as one solid unit like a door shutter door okay it tenses the soft palate and when the soft palate gets tense the attached muscles will work more uh, effectively and it opens the pharyngeotympanic tube because this the the tensor veli palatini also takes from the lateral side of the station tube the pharyngeotympanic tube it's called the infralateral surface is called the membranous part it's covered by a membrane not cartilage so it takes from that membrane while the levator veli palatini takes from the medial and inferior side of uh, the eustachian tube or the pharyngeotympanic tube. So when the muscle is attached to the tube, when it contracts, whenever it contracts, it opens the tube. That's why they give you a piece of gum uh, when flying to uh, always chew because while chewing, you are using your uh, tensor veli palatini and levator veli palatini, uh, uh, it, produce, it makes you produce more saliva, and so you have to swallow uh, the saliva produced, so you are in continuous state of, chew, of swallowing and chewing the gum. This makes sure that the tube does not uh, clog, does not uh, collapse on itself with the change of pressure. Okay, it accounts also for when the tube is closed, it accounts for a type of ear pain. Uh, we feel that when we get, sometimes when we get common cold and, uh, and the tube is closed, you will feel like this, uh, th there is depressurization of the middle ear. You feel this type of pain. Okay, the levator veli palatini muscle, now this um, originates from the uh, base of skull on the petrous bone, right anterior to the carotid opening or the carotid canal, and takes from the medial and inferior surface of the uh, station tube or pharyngeotympanic tube, and goes down um, um, Above the upper end of the uh, superior constrictor, remember the pharyngobasilar fascia? We said the pharyngobasilar fascia is pierced by uh, structures like the tube and uh, muscle around it, the levator veli palatini. It goes through the fascia to find itself at the superior surface of uh, the palate. Uh, and attaches itself. By the way, we forgot to say that the palate has inferior surface, which is this one. It's related to the oral cavity, so it's lined by the oral mucosa, which is stratified squamous epithelium. But the dorsal, dorsum of the soft palate, or the superior surface of soft palate, the one that's facing the nose, is, is covered by respiratory epithelium, pseudo-stratified columnar ciliated 
epithelium with goblet cells too okay so back to the uh, levator veli palatini uh, with its course when it contracts it will pull on the soft palate and will raise it now uh, pull on this side and pull on this side together working they will pull the whole thing but when a muscle is paralyzed um, um, like we see in, in bulbar palsy for example where you want you want to uh, to check the uh, vagus nerve because vagus nerve supplies these muscles you ask the patient to say ah now the ah makes the patient to use forces the patient to use the levator veli palatini muscles now if, if one side is paralyzed it won't trace the soft palate at this side and the uvula will deviate towards the healthy side towards the healthy side because it's pulled up by the healthy levator veli palatini muscle so if you said ah uh, and you notice that the uvula is not in the midline it, it deviated to one side so that side is the healthy side while the other side is the paralyzed side uneven okay another muscle of the palate palatopharyngeus muscle palatopharyngeus muscle actually it's not like, like the drawing here it takes from the superior surface of the soft palate by two laminae two origins one anterior that attaches to the soft palate and the posterior osseous border of the uh, heart palate and the posterior one that takes from the dorsum of the soft palate they both together unite to form the muscle and the muscle descends downwards see and fades into the wall of the pharynx now the palatopharyngeus what does it do it pulls on the palate downwards so uh, when we want to close the oropharyngeal isthmus and raising the tongue and approximating the arches towards the midline uh, this is the palatoglossus. What else? It elevates the pharynx. And remember, we need to elevate the pharynx to bring it above a, bo a bolus of food to push it down. Okay, so it elevates the pharynx and depresses the uh, palate. Now, remember that the palato, uh, gloss, uh, palatopharyngeus muscle raises the palatopharyngeal mucosal fold which is a feature of the oropharynx it's the posterior pillar of the fossas fossas means lewis okay um, uh, palatoglossus muscle from the inferior surface of the soft palate and uh, uh, goes down towards the tongue the side and upper and uh, lateral side of the tongue fades with the uh, actually fades with the tongue and the upper part of high glossus even uh, uh, the palatoglossus raises the palatoglossal fold makes the palatoglossus uh, glossal arch which is the boundary for the oropharyngeal isthmus what does it do it depresses the soft palate and elevates the back of tongue this to close the isthmus oropharyngeal isthmus now another muscle in the midline two muscles uh, uh, on the sides of the midline it's called the musculus uh, uvulae it takes from the posterior nasal spine which is bone and goes anterior or sorry goes posterior uh, to the uvula to the connective tissue that's uh, around the uvula union of the aponeurosis and attaches there now this muscle when it contracts it raises the uvula means it shortens this this area when this area is, is gets shortened by the contraction of the muscle it gets thicker 
So you have the two Levei Turveli Palatini on the sides, and the ten Turveli Palatini actually that's making the aponeuroses. Uh, the tensor is tensing more the lateral sides of the soft palate, but the middle aspect of the soft palate in the midline if you added a thickness to it that will be great for the function of the soft palate because all of it will be thick and uh, rather solid uh, and moves as one entity uh, um, like a door as i told you before um, this is the function of the musculus uh, uvulae these are these were the muscles of the soft palate. It's very easy and uh, hard to forget. Okay, the blood supply. The blood supply comes from three major arteries: the ascending palatine, the ascending pharyngeal, and the greater palatine. Now, the ascending palatine of facial. This we will study when we study the course of the facial artery. Uh, when it when it's deep to the submandibular gland, remember it was deep to it, then then superior and superficial because, to, to come out and go on the on the mandible in front of masseter. Uh, why did it go there deep? It it needed to supply the tonsils and the palate. It has a palatine branch, ascending palatine branch, reaches the soft palate and the hard palate. And uh, remember the ascending pharyngeal we studied early uh, when we studied the branches of the external carotid artery. It's the one that arises from the medial surface. Remember that? The ascending pharyngeal. It's a very important artery to supply the pharynx. And we talked about that in the pharynx. The greater palatine, it's uh, uh, from the uh, uh, pterygopalatine fossa and goes through a canal called the palatine canal. Uh, it's in the back of the uh, uh, maxillary bone and descends, uh, uh, descends in, in, um, in that canal and emerges, see, from the greater palatine foramen. Uh, and goes anterior, see, together with the nerve, greater palatine nerve. It's the major blood supply for the mucosa uh, and gingiva of the uh, upper jaw, the greater palatine artery. Do not forget that. It ends by passing through the incisive foramen and anastomosing with the nasopalatine artery that's uh, descending, descending from the nose. This is the story of the greater palatine artery. Lesser palatine comes out of the lesser palatine foramen and goes backwards to supply the soft palate, lesser palatine artery. See the palatine branches and tonsillar branches of the facial reaching the, uh, the soft palate and the tonsils. Okay, this is about the blood supply. The veins follow the arteries and eventually this will lead it to the pterygoid venous plexus it's a um, by the way the pterygoid lateral pterygoid muscle we call the third heart uh, definition of a heart is a pump it has a plexus of veins in so uh, within its substance so whenever it contracts it pumps the blood inside this plexus uh, it's called the pterygoid venous plexus in the lateral pterygoid muscle and uh, some tonsillar branches, tributaries, drain directly into the facial vein and eventually into the internal jugular vein. The lymphatics, of course, into the deep cervical lymph nodes. It goes with the veins, channels around the veins, opposite the arteries. The innervation by greater and lesser palatine nerves and the nasopalatine nerve. Now the nasopalatine nerve is coming down on the medial surface and um, uh, uh, emerges from or passes through the incisive foramen to uh, complete the area here and uh, uh, it's met with by the greater palatine nerve C, a nerve called descending palatine 
divides into greater and lesser palatine nerves. The greater palatine nerve uh, goes anteriorly and supplies the heart palate. The lesser palatine nerve goes to the uh, uh, soft palate. Okay? So this is the uh, story of the nasopalatine and greater, uh, greater and lesser palatines. The nasopalatine, we said it comes from the pterygopalatine fossa. It goes into the roof of the nose and descends on the medial wall of the nose. That is the medial septum. It's not apparent here. This is the lateral wall of the nose. This is a more lateral cut. It's not in the midline. If it's in the midline, you will see it going down the nasal sept until it reaches the incisive foramen. So don't forget greater palatine, lesser palatine, nasal palatine. Of course, you will not forget them. They all have palatine, palatine word in it. Greater palatine, lesser palatine, and nasal palatine nerves. Okay, these nerves carry sensory uh, sensory information and delivering autonomic information too. Now, the general somatic afferent fibers, general somatic afferent means that carry general sensations like pain, touch, temperature, okay? They all uh, go through branches of the maxillary. So whatever sensory, general somatic afferent sensation, these nerves, the, the one we talked about, carry, uh, they eventually uh, have cell bodies in the trigeminal ganglion, in the pterygopalatine ganglion. You know, um, you know the story of sensory neuron. The sensory neuron, uh, its body in uh, one side and its dendrite that brings the sensation. So actually, the nerves, sensory nerve we're seeing, are a collection of dendrites of the uh, uh, trigeminal ganglion cells there. Uh, what else? Uh, the uh, parasympathetic reaches, uh, uh, yes, through uh, branches of the maxillary nerve, but its origin came from the facial nerve called the great petrosal nerve, that has a story inside the skull, but it's a parasympathetic uh, uh, branch of the facial in the ear, uh, and it emerges from the middle ear and goes to the pterygopalatine fossa through uh, a, a canal called the pterygoid canal. So actually it changes its name into from great petrosal to nerve of pterygoid canal, then it enters and joins the maxillary branches to be distributed with it. The sympathetic, we know the origin of the sympathetic, especially the high ones, from the superior cervical sympathetic ganglia, but we know now the story of the sympathetic chain. Where did it get its power supply from? The major sympathetic uh, inflow from T1 of the spinal cord ascended in the sympathetic chain till it reached the superior cervical sympathetic ganglia and from there postganglionic fibers formed a plexus around the blood vessels and again these branches of uh, branches of these blood vessels go to the pterygopalatine fossa and join the nerves to be distributed to the area uh, you, may, you may wonder why do uh, why do we have parasympathetic supply do we have glands yes we have glands uh, uh, we have glands in the um, um, in the other parts of the oral cavity, other than the tongue, um, uh, other than the um, the one we studied. I mean, sorry, the submandibular, sublingual, and parotid. We'll study later. It's minute glands in in the wall of the oral cavity. Okay. Um, uh, all muscles of the palate are innervated by vagus nerve through the pharyngeal plexus, except tensor villi palatini. The tensor villi palatini by the mandibular nerve of the trigeminal. We will, when we get to the infratemporal fossa, we will um, uh, study the um, um, mandibular nerve and the 
one of the branches of the mandibular nerve is called the nerve to medial pterygoid muscle. This nerve to medial pterygoid will give two other muscles, the tensor tympani muscle in the ear and the tensor palatine. Remember the two tensors the supplied by the nerve to the medial uh, to medial pterygoid branch of mandibular, which is V3 mandibular of the trigeminal nerve. Now we'll get to the floor of the oral cavity. We will not study the whole floor today uh, because, you know, we've taken about 30 minutes now uh, and we must discuss the tongue in details. I will just take a hint about the floor of the oral cavity. It's formed of a muscular diaphragm, of course, the mylohyoid muscle, and on top of it, two cord-like muscles called the genohyoid muscles attached to the hyoid and the inferior mental spine of the mandible. This, th these two th comprise the diaphragm of the, and of course, major, major part is the mylohyoid muscle and the tongue resting on this diaphragm, the most superior. Now, this is the diaphragm. See the mylohyoid uh, muscle arising from the mylohyoid line and going to the midline where it meets its counterpart in the midline raphe, and posteriorly they attach to the body of the hyoid, hyoid bone. And on top of it is the uh, genohyoid, that's cord like muscles. Uh, okay. Um, that acts on the hyoid bone too. Now, the, the mylohyoid uh, and uh, genohyoid, they participate in pulling up the hyoid bone or pull, pulling down the mandible, I mean open the mouth, especially the mylohyoid, of course. The mylohyoid is supplied by the nerve to mylohyoid, which comes from uh, the mandibular uh, that is of trigeminal and uh, genohyoid I want you to remember the nerve supply of the genohyoid remember now it's the C1 fibers distributed carried by the hypoglossal nerve so it's never say the hypoglossal nerve say C1 via the hypoglossal nerve. It's not the hypoglossal nerve. Now, of course, we have muscles, so we have gateways. Remember the gateways of the pharynx we talked about, above the superior constrictor and the oropharyngeal uh, uh, aperture, okay? The gateway of the floor of the mouth is the oropharyngeal aperture. It's a big aperture, and we said that uh, lots of structures pass through there, like the high glossus with the related structures, lingual uh, nerve and hypoglossal nerve on the lateral side, lingual vessels on the medial side, styloglossus, stylopharyngeus, glossopharyngeal nerve, pharyngeal branch of vagus, all these pass through the aperture and, of course, uh, uh, lymphatics. Um, this will be the end of this lecture, I think, for you to be able to study properly. And next time we'll get to the rest of the floor of the mouth, that is the tongue. Okay? Thank you for watching.